With us today is Hubert Jolie. Uh, we're super fortunate to have him with us. He's the former chairman and CEO of Best Buy. He's been recognized as one of the 100 best performing CEOs in the world by Harvard Business Review, one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's, one of the top 10 CEOs in the United States in Glassdoor's annual Employees Choice Award. He has written most recently the book called The Heart of Business, uh, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. He is smart, he is thoughtful, he is charming. Uh, Hubert, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Peter, I so look forward to our conversation. And people don't believe anything that Peter said, right? Other than <laughs> my name, okay? <laughs> um, so, you know, you did this remarkable turnaround at Best Buy and, and you've written really beautifully both about it and your philosophy of, of business. And a lot of people are articulate about their philosophies of business without the practical experience of having of having acted in it the way you have. Uh, a lot of people are actually very, very effective in business without being able to articulate it. You have the gift of, of having done both, which is, you know, a gem, a gem for the podcast and for our listeners and for me personally. And I know you personally, and I'm really, I really uh, am so appreciative uh, of, of you and of that. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to start with you know, how how you became you, right? So a lot of times, any profile that, that that one reads about successful business, like will be about the turnaround or about, and I'm kind of curious, you know, for listeners who are at the beginning of their career or or my kids, you know, who are in their teens, who are ones in middle my, school. Ones in, my students, right? I, or your yes. students, right? Or your students um, who have aspirations, but they don't necessarily know how to take, you know, they can see where they want to be, but they don't necessarily know how to get there. So I would love to hear your story of, you know, how, how you got to where you are, how you got involved in business in the first place, what attracted you, what first steps you took, uh, that kind of thing. Oh, no, uh, uh, I'm happy to do this. And, and you'll see, I'm not going to necessarily give you exactly my resume, but maybe some of the milestones mm -hmm. that really played a key role. So I grew up in France, Peter. Uh, and I went to some of the best schools. When I was a teenager, uh, initially I wanted to be a vet because my godfather was a vet, so I thought it was really cool. Uh, but quite quickly I said, no, I, I'd like to be in business and lead an organization. So I went to the leading business school in France. I also had a master in public administration. Uh, when I finished that, I really didn't know what industry or function I wanted to work in. So I went into consulting. So I spent a dozen years with McKinsey and Company, and I studied my professional life as a hard charging, deeply analytical, you know, problem solver at McKinsey he focused on maximize helping clients maximize performance. And I think what we're going to talk about is that today, uh, while I still love solving problems, I'm also somebody who, who believes in unleashing human magic as the key driver of extraordinary performance. And after leaving McKinsey, I went, you know, I worked in a variety of industry sectors. I worked you know, I worked in IT services, in video games, media and entertainment, travel, hospitality, and then finally retailing. But rather than tell you the play-by-play -play of my resume, <laughs> uh, I'd like to give you a few milestones because I think they, they determine how I think about leadership today. Right. So the first milestone was uh, 30 years ago. Um, I was having dinner with a client of mine at McKinsey, and uh, that guy, Jean-Marie Descarpentries, a French CEO, told me, Hubert, the purpose of a company is not to make money. That was 30 years ago. It's an imperative, but it's not the ultimate goal. And he said, there's other imperatives in business, by the way. He called it the people imperative. I mean, having the right teams properly equipped. Uh, the business imperative, having customers who are happy with your products. And then the financial imperative. And he says, you have to think about it, about them in sequence. Excellence on the People imperative is what leads to excellence on the business imperative, which leads to excellence on the financial imperative. And the ultimate goal, you know, don't confuse a result, which is the, the, the profit, with the ultimate goal. If you think about it philosophically, the ultimate goal has had to do, has, must have something to do with developing people, serving people, uh, and so on and so forth. And he said, now a lot of people are going to talk about this, right? Now, the question is, what do you do with it? And so, for example, he said, when you're going to be running a business, 
start your monthly performance review with people, then customers, then finish with financial results. Not the other way around. If you do the other way around, you're going to spend your entire meeting on financial performance. You're going to miss people and customers. That was a, a very significant moment that I, I, still, I still cherish today. You know, and in your book, you actually go a step further. You say that profit is not a good measure of economic performance. Right? Yeah, and it, so it was to a, me like that's yeah. even saying within the economic realm, yeah. the money realm, profit isn't a good measure. Say say more about that. Yeah, at some point in my career, I was the deputy CFO of a, of a large French company, and I so I had to look into generally accepted accounting principles. And talking with the accountants, Gap is not even trying to represent economic reality because there's so many things that don't don't go on the balance sheet, like you know the quality of your workforce doesn't go on your balance sheet or externalities like the damages you create on the environment, you know, that doesn't go on your PL. So it's not even trying. So let's not fall in love with that. The other important milestone I want to talk about was because it played such a big role in shaping my philosophy was when two friends of mine who are monks in a religious congregation asked me to uh, write with them articles uh, in philosophy and theology in general, but the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work? Is work a punishment? Is it a curse because some dude sent in paradise? Is it something we do so that we can do something else? Or is work, like Vic Viktor Frankl you know, believes, is work part of our fulfillment as human beings, part of our search yeah. for meaning? Yeah. And of course, you know, it's a choice. We can decide. I think if we see it as part of our fulfillment, it changes everything. And I think that uh, our search for meaning can be a foundation for how we think about, uh, about business. So that was a second important milestone for me. You know, I'm curious when you're, you know, you're a McKinsey consultant and you're very analytically driven, you're very successful at it. So like, you know how to do that. And, uh, and it's, you know, you look at shareholder values and you look at, you know, how people assess the success of the company generally. And you think, I'm really good at this. I understand it. I, uh, um, and, and, it's, and it's generally accepted, you know, like GAP is generally accepted accounting principles. Like it's generally accepted that, you know, this is how you, how you make a successful business. It, um, deciding that you're going to prioritize other things behind besides the economics reflects also reflects a risk right it reflects a risk to the way you've thought about business up until that time the way you've been educated about business i'm curious and, and i think there's all sorts of times in our lives where where we see something that is inspiring beyond what we're doing and yet pursuing it because it's not generally accepted as the way to go, reflects that same kind of risk. And I'm curious what happened, like how you made the move, how you moved yourself, how you were willing to take that risk to say, there's something I'm, there's something this CEO is saying to me that I'm drawn to. You could have decided to say, yeah, whatever, and, and continue to do what you're doing, but you didn't. You yep. let that change yep. your life. Yeah, and, and there's two there's two moments here. One is when I left McKinsey, so for the first time I was running something that was the president of EDS France, and it was a turnaround. And I actually applied what Jean-Marie had shared with me, and I saw that it works. And so one of the things I've learned in life, by the way, is that 98% of the questions that are asked as either or are better answered as and. So should we choose between people and profit? It's and. Right. And we all know that it's having great teams that leads to great outcome. And so I was able then to practice that. And I saw how powerful this was. Right. And the other moment, Peter, was, uh, so 20 years ago, you know, to quote David Brooks, in a sense, I was at the top of my first mountain. Mm -hmm. Right. I had been a partner at McKinsey. I was on the executive team of, of Vivendi Universal, a major media and entertainment company. So by many measures, I was successful, except it was empty. There was no joy. There was no meaning in that. And so call this my midlife crisis, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that led me to want to slow down and step back. 
I continued working intensively, but took the time to go inside, if you will. Yeah. It, it turns out that I did the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. There's many other ways to do this, but it led me to reconnect, you know, my head and the rest of my body, mm -hmm. my soul and my heart, and try to discern what I wanted to do with my life. You know, later this week, we'll, at Harvard, we do a, a workshop for new CEOs. Mm -hmm. One of the things we ask them to do is to write their retirement speech. Mm -hmm. My beautiful wife, Hortense, whom you know, who is one of the foremost executive leadership coaches in the world, she asked her client to write down their eulogy. Mm -hmm. What people, what we would like people to say when, that day when you're not here to listen anymore. And so then if we're clear about you know, our purpose in life and what drives us, then that also changes how we think about business because, you know, we, we make things complicated. What is a company at the end of the day? It's a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And we make it essentially what we want. And the right. stakeholders we serve, whether it's the employees, the customers, the shareholders, all of them are also human beings. Right. So let me ask you, like, I, I don't want this question to distract us too much because I, I love this, the personal conversation here. I am thinking about, you know, John Mackey, who was on this podcast and who's the CEO of Whole Foods and who wrote Conscious Capitalism and like, you know, 20 years ago was talking about all of these stakeholders and it's catching on, but not as fast as you would think. And I guess my question is, what do you think is like, this makes so much common sense. Yeah. It's, it's human and it gets results. So what do you think gets in the way of yeah, people yeah. adopting this? Yeah, so, and, and certainly we've seen a huge acceleration in the last two years. So today, when I speak with, you know, CEOs of large companies, with shareholders, private equity players, executives, I would say, Peter, today, the vast, vast majority of people believe it's the right direction. Mm -hmm. and we've all seen the BRT statement on corporate purpose two years ago, so I think it's, and when you look at service people, even Larry Fink, the, you know, the CEO of BlackRock, the largest fund in the world, says, you know, work on your long-term strategy, your purpose, you need to be a force. So everybody agrees. The challenge is not being convinced intellectually. It's doing it because doing it is really hard because we've been trained in a certain way and we need to rewire how we think about business uh, how we think about the various functions in business. Uh, uh, we, we need to rethink our mission. Importantly, we need to rethink how we lead. Mm -hmm. And this is hard because we need to move from being, you know, uh, business leaders uh, to being also human leaders. We need to move from, it's all about profits to know it's a, a declaration of interdependence. Mm -hmm. We need to move one of the things, you know, on my FBI most wanted list, you know, there's two people, Milton Friedman, you know, inventor of shareholder primacy, and Bob McNamara, former Ford executive, but also U.S. Secretary of Defense during that time, who, you know, exemplified top-down scientific management. Take a bunch of smart people, create a plan, communicate that plan, put incentives in place, and hope that th something happens. Eh, it doesn't work. And yet right. that's how we've been wired. So there's a, and so the reason, part of the reason why I wrote this book and why I'm now at Harvard Business School and coaching executives is that so many are eager to move in that direction and, you know, are now able to say, I want to do this and I need some help. Right, right. It's great. It's beautiful. Um, let's fast forward now to Best Buy. So, so Best Buy, you come in. Uh, your, your Jim Citrin, who's a friend of both of ours, you know, tells you, like, you know, you got to think about this. You're thinking, why? This is crazy. Like, why would I ever do this? Um, and, and you decide to do it. And, and you know, the, I'll, I'll share the punchline, right? Which is the stock price while you're working there goes from $11 to $110. We know that economic value is not all about, about share price. But you also transform Best Buy as a force for good. Now I have to admit, like I've, you know, I'm I'm an Apple aficionado, and I've gone into Best Buy a few times here in New York, and I and I your experience that you write about in the book about having walked into a Best Buy and like there's three 
blue shirts who are talking to each other and they want to charge you $18 for a screen protector to put on the screen protector. And that that was also my experience a little bit sometimes working in Best Buys. And and I and I think as I read those words, I think to myself, you know, I could understand a hospital being a force for good. I could understand, you know, not-for-profits being a force for good. I could understand Whole Foods being a force for good. But Best Buy? Like, how do you make that argument to people? How do you make this argument? And you did it, right? And yeah. you did it in a way that inspired the organization. So I'm really curious to, to hear for you to share with the audience, like, how do you how do you look at Best Buy and say, you know, there's untapped potential here, and the answer is that it's people. Yeah, and so there was two phases in my journey at Best Buy. One was saving the company back in 2012. And so we did this by, you know, doing a number of operational improvement, making sure prices were competitive, that the online shopping experience was good, that we invested in, in the stores, you know, to improve the customer experience. We partnered with the world's foremost tech companies, including Apple and Microsoft and Samsung and Sony to, you know, you know help them showcase their, the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D. So this was, you know, the, the, the turnaround. We also did, took some cost out. Um, but then to your question, so fast forward from 2012 to now 2016, we had saved the company and we were working on how do we accelerate our growth and what kind of company do we want to become when we grow up? And we started the traditional way. We did market research, segmentation. We found that there was a group of us customers who are you know, interested in technology, but frankly need help with it. We call them the high touch tech fans. That was our target segment. And mm -hmm. we, we were gonna be helpful to them, help them you know, uh, to try to understand their needs and find the right solution for them. So in a, in a human way. But then there's something else that happened. And at the time I was watching you know, Simon Sinek uh, TED talk about start with why, why? Uh, which fits with this question, why do we work? Why are we here? And during one of our executive offset, that was a turning point. Uh, when we were working on our strategy, for, I had asked every one of the executive team members to come to the uh, offsite with a picture of themselves when they were little, two or three years old. And Peter, we had some really cute pictures back then. I bet, I bet. And over dinner, we spent the evening sharing with each other our life story and our purpose in life. And what we discovered is a couple of things. One, all of us uh, are human beings, right? Not just a CFO or CMO or CHO, right? Uh, we have a beautiful life story with some quirks and some drama and so forth. And two, with a couple of exceptions, all of us share the same kind of goal in life, right? Do something good to other people, you know, mm -hmm. the, the golden rule. And leave, you know, make a positive difference in the world. And then we said, gee, you know, we're the executive team, we're the leadership team of Best Buy. Why don't we use this platform to be a force for good in the world and build a company that employees can love, customers can love, community, and then shareholders. Now, to your point, yes, we're not Medtronic, we're not Mayo Clinic. So what does that mean? Well, that was, I think, very transformative. We said, we're actually not, as we to our purpose, we're not a consumer electronics retailer, even though, even though we may look like one. Mm -hmm. We are a company that's in the business of enriching people's lives through technology by addressing key human needs. Okay? Right. And what this does is does a couple of things. One is vastly expands the addressable market, right? Because there's right. many things. You don't need to be limited to what you can do in a four wall of a retailer. That's how we got into the health space helping aging seniors. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of my mother, right? Who's 91 years old yeah. and for whom an iPad and an Apple watch have changed her life in, in many ways. Like it's created a sense of safety. She can sleep alone yes. at home if she wants to. And the iPad with a 12.9 inch screen, she can kind of manage herself. And, you know, one of the services we have for your mom is that uh, we, uh, and it was partly an acquisition, but we'll put sensors in the home of aging seniors, under the bed, under the sofa, in the kitchen, in the bathroom. And through remote monitoring and AI, we can identify there's, if there's changes in patterns, not eating enough, 
not drinking enough, not sleeping enough, right. and then trigger an intervention. That's wow. a game changer. Right. Okay. Uh, and so that's a new market we went into. And so expands the addressable market. And of course, it's a bit more inspiring than just being a retailer. Well, and it's actually interesting from a turnaround perspective. I mean, I've seen this with some of my own clients. You're going from a product to a solution, right? Exactly. You're sort of saying, let's solve a problem, right? And then a relationship, because we, we have a, an initiative called in-home advisor. If your right. need is too complex, right, we'll come to you. We'll come to your right. apartment. We'll, and we'll try to understand what you're trying to accomplish. We'll build a solution, we'll suggest a solution, and we can become your CIO or CTO for your home. Right, right. And, and, and build a true relationship. Now, you could say this is many companies, right, Peter? They write their purpose, it's on the website, blah, 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 and nothing happens. Right. In our case, it actually happened because the, the, the purpose became the cornerstone of our strategy. And then uh, over time, something happened which is it really came to life because we found in a, I, you, know, you said I led the turnaround. Well, people around me, you know, they, I learned so much from them. Right. Uh, we found a way for everybody at the company to write themselves into that story. Mm -hmm. So this is not a case where we said, here is a new purpose. Why don't, you, don't you love it? No, right. leadership, you know, used to be outside in and top down. I right. think now it's much more bottom up and inside out. Right. And we can talk about what it took, but today, you know, this is a company where people have a spring in their step and they're, you know, they, they, people at the company call this their home, their family, and they want to do great things for others. And it's, there was a point where I saw, you know, the top line growth accelerate. And I said, this, this defies logic, right? This right. is irrationally good. And that's because we had unleashed human magic at the company. Right. In yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I was struck in reading about how, you know, at every level of the organization, you know, frontline blue shirt workers, you know, selling iPhone cases, you're asking the question, what are your dreams? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So which was the, the same question as with the executive team and, and, uh, you know, because the, 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 this can be done for people listening, right? This, this can be done at any level within the organization. To, to illustrate this, there was a store general manager in Boston. He would, in fact, ask everyone in the store, what is your dream? At Best Buy, outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Write it down in the break room. And he said, then, my job is to help you achieve your dream. Peter, mm -hmm. if you do this at scale, it changes everything because then people can be all in in their job because right. it, it's, it starts from within. Was it difficult to get managers or even supervisors who are not necessarily thinking on that level? Like, how do you get them? How do you help them think on the level of saying, my job is to help my, you know, my immediate staff, like uh, achieve their dreams. Like that's, that's a big leap for a manager at Best Buy, I would imagine, or a supervisor on the floor at Best Buy. How do you help them get there? Yeah, so this is, the broader question is, you know, how do you create an environment where you can unleash that human magic? Right. This, and how do you change the culture? Um, one decision, one leverage point you have as a leader, maybe that's the most important point, is who do you put in positions of power? Mm -hmm. Right, because... We, as leaders, we, there's very little we do, right? It all gets done through other people. Right. So who do we put in positions of power and how do you decide? And right. by the way, my thinking on that has dramatically evolved, Peter. It used to be all about you know, experience and expertise. I wanted the best marketing person, the best supply chain person. Now I'm much more interested in who is this person? What drives right. them? How do they right. want to be remembered? Yeah, I, I can even see the fault in my own question, which is, I, I, I even inherent in my question is, oh, we as leaders know how to do that, but you know, supervisors on a on a, a retail floor don't, and I immediately see how wrong that is, like how how it's not that's not a position based uh, uh, understanding or competence; it's a person based competence. And, and, and what you, what you're putting your finger on something really important where so many of us have got to rewire our brain. It's back to the top down thing. We're going to tell people what right. to do. So right. people listening to this podcast, 
raise your hand if you like to be told what to do. Right, right. Right? Now, Peter, we cannot see, right? But I can bet. <laughs> I don't see many no, hands. It's, it's the basis of my new book that's come out, which is people don't resist change. They resist being changed, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to be changed, but people are happy to change. And so in the book, we, I try to provide you know, many examples, very concrete examples and stories and tools on how to go from outside in and top down, which is necessary, but add this bottom up and inside out because motivation is intrinsic and you want the frontliners, the managers to, on their own volition, to want to create happiness around them. Right. And treat other people around them, whether it's employees or customers, as human beings. Right. And there's an entire architecture that I've learned about, uh, about these ingredients that, you, that uh, are necessary to create that, uh, that, that environment. And the first one is about connecting dreams. The second one is around creating an environment where there can, there can be genuine human connections. Right. right? Which is, um, again, back to this idea of we, we need to become human leaders. I'm curious, you know, like you, you, you sort of broke this turnaround into two phases, right? One, which is the turnaround itself, where you did some, made some hard decisions around the turnaround. And then it's, it, it feels like, and I don't know that you can make such a clear line or distinction, but it becomes this heart centered, you know, how do we really. No, no. So let me, let me pick on this. The yeah. first phase was incredibly human centric uh -huh. because this philosophy of business being about pursuing a noble purpose and putting people at the center and then treating profit as an outcome also applied during the turnaround. My first week on the job, to illustrate the point, I spent in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, mm -hmm. listening to the frontliners. Frontliners CEO were not the problem. With, with the label, that's when you had CEO in training as the yes. label. Because <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. laughs> the, the, the frontliners had all of the answers. And you know, it was also about creating the right team at the top. It was about creating human energy to get going and fix what was broken. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, and we saw this also, Peter, during the last two years, right? The last, where the last two years incredibly challenging, right? And this is a time where you had to lead from a place of purpose and with humanity, where you had to be able to, you know, be empathetic like never before. Mm -hmm. that you, uh, your main quality as a leader was to be empathetic, but also to have humility and be able to say, my name is Hubert and I don't know and I need help because there was no manual. So right. the leader who is the superhero who knows everything, eh, that's gone. Right. Right. So that's a big shift. So when the going gets tough, you know, that's frankly where uh, empathy Humidity and vulnerability are key leadership attributes that we need today. And meanwhile, you still have to make hard decisions. You still yeah. have to decide, yeah. you know, there's ways that you're going to reorganize. Yeah. You're going to close yeah. that store. You're going to, um, uh, how do you balance that confidence with the, you know, the confidence to make hard decisions with the humility of not knowing? So it, it depends a little bit. So let's take some examples. You know, the, the, <laughs> Maybe the most courageous decision we made back in 2012 was to decide to match Amazon prices. Mm -hmm. I had to make that decision, but you know I was surrounded with you know very smart people, who and we had done some tests and and so we had the facts. So ultimately, I had to make the decision, and you know uh, some, sometimes you, you do have to be decisive. And when the ship is sinking, the boss needs to make a few decisions for sure. Right. But fast forward. Uh, March of 2020. So I'm now the executive chairman of the company and Corey mm -hmm. is the uh, CEO. And Corey is dealing with a tough situation, right? Because of COVID, uh, yes, we are a, an essential retailer, but uh, we don't know yet how to operate the store, the store safely. Some municipalities want us to close the store. You know, it's, it's, we have 1,000 stores across the US. There's no way Corey can decide make decide every day which store should, should open right there's no way right so what did curry do she laid out uh, um, principles based on her on, on her sense of purpose her sense of purpose is stewardship she wants to leave the place in better shape mm -hmm. and so the principles were one priority number one is going to be the safety of our employees and our customers priority number two or principle number two 
uh, we're going to delay as long as humanly possible furloughing or letting go anyone until the federal programs kick in, kick in and we have had a chance to you know, help with the employees with that. Right. Priorities number three, everything we do, we have to make sure that it's good for us in the long term. And then she told Damien, the head of stores, you're in charge of deciding which stores should be open every day. I cannot do this. So as long as you comply with these principles, you know, uh, you can run with that. Right. And of course, the other aspect of vulnerability was for Corey to say, look, there is no manual on this uh, COVID thing. So I don't even know what COVID is. So let me say, I don't know. She called people at Mayo Clinic and other, you know, in, in Minnesota, we have a lot of health companies, right? And, right. and ask for advice and how to, uh, uh, to, to do this. But it's, you know, you can empower others if, if you can frame some principles uh, in, in, in the spirit of people don't like to be told what to do, they're, they're gonna be happy to run with it. What advice do you have for people who want to become more heart-centered leaders? Like how do we become more heart-centered leaders? Uh, and, and Peter, I don't have, you know, the, the corner of wisdom on that. It, and I'm still on the journey, right? So let's be clear, right? I don't want to mislead anybody. Uh, I think it starts with, so remember a long time ago when we were flying, if the oxygen mask was going to come down, you know, the steward would tell us, put the mask on yourself first before you can help others. Mm -hmm. And I know you believe this, right? As leaders, Paradoxically, it's so critical that we start by taking care of ourselves mm -hmm. and do the work and spend the time to uh, connect with who we are, how we want to live our life, have a clear sense of purpose and boundaries and principles, how we want to be remembered. Uh, and then as we go through these difficult times, um, as we want to be human leaders with others, make sure we take care of ourselves. So exercise, meditate, connect, you know, maybe at the end of every day or at the end of every week, you know, and our common friend Marshall, right? I love his questions, right? Did I, do, did, I do, did I do my best today to be a great human leader, to connect with Peter or with Corey? Not was I perfect. The quest for perfection is, is really a bad thing, right? So right. be kind with yourself because if you were not perfect today, and by the way, there's no way you're going to be perfect. If you, right. if you were a six out of 10 on, on one of the things you were trying to, there's always tomorrow. Right. 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 And so, and then, so that's dealing with yourself. And then with others, be curious. People talk about the great resignation. I think that what's called in front of the great resignation is a great re recruiting. Reconnect with people. Right. You know, how are you? No, no, no. How are you really? I know it's right. hard, right? Right. What, what's important to you, you know? Uh, what, what, what are you struggling with? What have been some of, you know, your most difficult moment in the last week? You know, what, what, what really drives you? What's important to you as we right. go through this? And have a really authentic, empathetic listening. Uh, I know that some CEOs during these times, outside of any business meeting, they would have one-on-one -on -one genuine connection. Let's connect. Right. 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 Um, and again, that doesn't mean that we're going to forget about running the, the business, but we need to add this dimension of and, and not being afraid to be vulnerable. So a great role model for me is Cami Scarlett, who uh, uh, is the head of HR at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, she disclosed with everybody at the company that for years she'd been struggling with the depression following the death of her two parents. Do you know many C-level executives who say, no, I'm struggling with mental health? No, we're supposed to be superheroes for crying out loud. Right. The fact that she did this signaled to everybody at the company that it's okay to need help, that of course we're struggling. In any population, there is a percentage of people who are struggling with mental health issues. And then we can help each other. That was the big, maybe the, one of the biggest transformations for me personally. Right was to stop believing I needed to be perfect and do everything on my own. And that I could say, no, I, I need help. And, uh, you know, and, and reach out to others and, and truly connect from that. So these are some of the I, thoughts. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struck uh, by what you said before, which is you know, what I always sort of say when I'm thinking about these things, which is 
I'm not some guru on up high who has all the answers and has my perfect life. Like I'm curious, I'm asking questions, I'm understanding. And what I'm curious about for you, Hubert, is um, where is your edge right now? Like, what are you struggling to learn? What are you grappling with personally? You know, you're, you've, you've moved from, from, you know, day-to-day -day running of, of Best Buy. Now you're uh, uh, teaching at Harvard Business School and you're teaching, you know, CEOs and you're, um, you're writing uh, and, and I'm, you know, you're kind of going into a new phase of your contribution to the world. And I'm sort of curious where your edge is and what you feel like you're, the way you're hoping to develop and grow. Yeah, so but, uh, this is a very exciting time for me, uh, you know, personally, because I'm married to one of the most extraordinary women in the world. And two, because I feel I'm a, on this uh, purposeful journey of giving back and helping the next generation of leaders you know, become the best they can be in this context and help build a, uh, a better world. Because right? there's, there's no doubt, and I had to slow down last year, Peter, even though I'm the eternal optimist, I had to say out loud, the world we live in is not working, right? Mm -hmm. We have a health crisis, an economic crisis, societal issues, racial issues, environmental issues, geopolitical mm -hmm. tension. It's not working. And what's the definition of madness, right? Do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. So my passion is to add my voice and my energy to those who are eager to create a, a better model, which I think has got to be around purpose and, and humanity and embrace this idea of embracing all stakeholders in the declaration of interdependence. So my focus is that one of the things I'm the most excited about uh, at HBS is we're piloting prog a program which we're calling Putting Purpose to Work and Unleashing Human Magic mm -hmm. to help companies who are on that journey, you know, make purpose come to life in a genuine fashion and really unleash the magic within their employee population. And we're also doing that in the MBA program. And I'm working with extraordinary colleagues in the faculty to make this happen because I'm just a young Padawan at the school, so I need to, to learn. So I'm, I'm asking for help. The one thing that I would highlight in that context, though, in terms of, you know, um, needing help other than, you know, this, I need help on, you know, as we create this program, but also I need uh, constant help on how to prioritize uh, uh, my life because it's with everything that I'm doing, it's easy to be underwater. And so I'm trying to uh, develop some new disciplines on how to be focused and be able to uh, not say yes to everything I'd like to say yes to. And so right. I've been asking for help on this particular <laughs> front. That, <laughs> and and that's a big one for someone yeah. who's been, you know, active and taking growing and growing, and growing challenges. And now, you know, your challenge isn't just Best Buy, it's the world. And so you know, like that's a, that's an ambitious challenge. So um, how is it to ask for help in that? Oh, and that's, you know, and I, that's where I give credit to our common friend, Marshall Goldsmith, who, was my coach for so many years. You know, the ability to be able to uh, realize that it's actually a sign of strength. And that's one of the things I'm teaching my students to ask for help and right. to say, I'm struggling. Anybody's got advice. Uh, uh, uh. And so then you're getting great advice. You know, I got, got great advice yesterday. In fact, from Marshall, who said one way to think about this prioritization question is at the margin, this next hour you're deciding to allocate. You know, mm -hmm. considering that you don't have that much time left in the world, is this the best way you can think of allocating this time? Right. Which I, which is very because because the, the question of is what I'm doing in line with my purpose? Check, check, check. Right? Am I right. finding meaning? Yes. And but I thought that this his advice this resonated with me. So my most frequently used phrase these days, Peter, is my name is Uber. And I need help. Right. <laughs> um, you 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 talk about purpose and and just in terms of is this worthwhile in terms of where you're spending your time and and you have a model of of this intersection of four things and it reminds me of Frederick Beekner who's the, the the Christian theologian and and one of my favorite quotes of all time is you know your vocation is where is you know where your greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. And you have, you've added some things to that. You're, you sort of said what you love, what the world needs, 
what you're good at and what you can be paid for. And, you know, which, which kind of brings some reality, you know, like tangible reality to this idea of, yes, do what you want that you love and what you need. And also that you can be rewarded well for because you're really good at it and you can really have a successful impact on it. And, and what's beautiful about these four circles and circles, and some people call this sticky guy, uh, is that you can apply it for your personal purpose. And you can also apply it for the purpose of the company. And the company, and I, right. and I do believe that uh, I have an article that uh, should come out this month in HBR, which is uh, Man's Search for Meaning, to quote uh, Viktor Frankl, as foundation for business purpose. Mm -hmm. All right? And the, as, as, as companies work on defining their business purpose, their corporate purpose, you know, sometimes it's fluffy, it's too high level. No, no, this is rigorous work. Mm -hmm. And taking the time to understand what are the needs in the world that, um, that exist? What, what are the ones for which you are uniquely qualified to address them? What are you passionate about as a group of human beings in how you can make money? I think that's a great framework for defining a corporate purpose. And then, of course, the work is about how do you make it come to life? But, that, but you need a solid foundation there. We have been talking with Hubert Jolie. The Heart of Business is his new book, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. Hubert, I'm so happy that as we were coming to the hour of doing this interview, that you decided that this was a place you wanted to spend you know, your limited time on this earth. This one hour would be one that we could have this conversation and it's to the benefit of me and all of our listeners. So thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. And thank you, Peter, for opening your platform to these important messages. Thank you. And it's so much fun to speak with you. And likewise.